Oh, are these are new batteries too. Shoot. Okay. Well, so. So what I'm trying to get across here is that we use conceptual models for very practical reasons, not just with regard to like physics, um, but even something like this. Uh, um, the the uh, easiest, uh, I think, the bestest, bestest, most best, better, 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 best. Yeah. Uh, um, is uh, uh, what's it called? Um, pop, let's go pop. Pop. So it's it's I think his most recent book that gives us this, but so we'll call it model dependent realism. So we have to create these models. The models are very useful, uh, and, 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 and to the extent that they work, they are true. But we have to recognize that we have lots of different conceptual models. They're all true. Don't be misled into thinking that like whatever your, mo your favorite model is is true, therefore means that the other ones are false, and we should kill people that believe this. <laughs> Wrong choice, right? You know, they have a model too. In fact, uh, as, as American pragmatists, we can come to realize that, gosh, the more models that are useful that you have in your bag of tricks, the more powerful you are. So learning more models, right? And that's, that's the uh, uh, value of diversity. Uh, as, as long as their diverse opinions are all valid opinions, and in, in some contexts, we can learn other contexts following by learning from those individuals that have that, that model, right? Um, but yeah, you, you can have wrong models, you know, if I stick these pins in this doll, you're going to feel pain. You know, and the reason that my house got washed away was because you said something nasty about me last week. You know, no, those models are not very good. Let's look at the, the weather model. You know, they're accurate to some degree, but because some of the we don't have all the information and know how it interacts with the other information, there's still unknowns, still variables. They can only be so accurate up to a point. But as we get more information and and the model itself that improves, works. you know, the the model will get more and, and more people accurate. People do have to get over the flat Earth thing. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a real thing? And I think it's like an internet thing. That's what I think. Like, if the internet didn't exist, this wouldn't be able to conversation. All my life, everywhere I've been, the Earth has been relatively flat. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the plane was flat. Like yeah, and uh, all the stars in the sky are bioluminescent lights. So when you go high enough, you can see When I put my Oculus Rift on, though, and I go on uh, Google, Google Earth VR, and then I back up from the Earth, I go, oh, shit, I'm getting in space. <laughs> There goes a pig. Pigs in space. No, that's sorry. No, actually, the most accurate weather detection systems are six percent accurate. Well, I, I like thinking weather people are never wrong because they said the probability of rain. <laughs> so, so oh, you know, you said eighty percent chance of rain, and it didn't rain. So you were wrong. No, I said 80% probability. You're looking at the 20%, and that's, that's what happened. I was, I was exactly right. I was just the 20% that had to be right. Okay, so having framed uh, this issue then and talking about meaning of life being based in a narrative, which is an interpretive stance, on your life, right? And a model, basically, right? So you're creating these narratives as models that give you your role and your values, right? So Thomas Nagel gives us this interesting puzzle, primarily because he's talking about the nature of consciousness, uh, because in order for you to have a model, a narrative that you're trying to follow in your life, 
you have to have consciousness. I, we kind of hinted at that. Um, uh, uh, Susan Wolf, who by the way was a student of Thomas Nagel, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, uh, she points out, you know, some people can't even do this. You know, some people don't even ha get to have the worry about meaning in life because of their circumstances or mental capacity or non-linguistic abilities. Uh, uh, you know, in other words, you have you you have to be pretty much at the top of the elite food food chain. As, as I suggested you guys are, right? Uh, that you can be concerned about these kinds of things, right? Not everybody, uh, I, I think one of you emailed me about it and I referred to, the, I love the word sheeple, right? <laughs> you know, the people that said, you know, an authority says, the reason you're here is because this, 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 and this. And you go, oh, okay. So you're not going to be the critical thinker thinking for yourself why you're here. You're gonna to listen to whatever authority you did choose, or your parents chose, or whatever, but you believe that authority, and they tell you what the purpose of life is, and you believe it. Maybe eventually you have a, you know, someone disagree and say, oh, he said such and such, you're totally wrong, that's not it at all, it's the devil, you know, or whatever, right? Uh, and that's when you end up with uh, um, anguish, mental anguish, you know, because you now have narrative conflict, not just between like warring factions out on the field who believe different things. This is our land. No, this is our land. No, God gave it to us. No, God gave it to us. Ishmael versus Isaac, right? No. How, you know, how, do, you, how do you handle that story? Come in and say, both of you guys are wrong for believing in an ancient story. Your DNA is the same anyway, so forget it. That doesn't solve the problem, of course, because they go, no, he has, you know, it's keep shooting at one another anyway. Unless they take away their guns and then they use knives. They take the knives away, then they use cars. Sorry. However, you have to be at the top of the food chain to be linguistic enough and then to have you think of it, this is a computer program being installed in your mind so that you can run this process and be self-reflective and wonder, gee, why am I here? <coughs> and by the way, uh, computers are trying to figure out ways of making artificial intelligence able to do this, right? Ooh. And then, of course, we get into ethical dilemmas, you know, do we want computers to think for themselves? That's an Android. Pardon? Have you seen Androids Japan develop? Uh, what, what, when I think of this, I think of uh, Ex Machina or Ex Machina, mm -hmm. uh, the these. movie, right? Ava. Chinese room experiment, which, by the way, I've met, I, I wrote in my, my notes Thomas Nagel's argument here. I wrote Chinese room experiment my notes somewhere. Yeah, but I thought it, so. Oh, there it is, right on page 301. Chinese room experiment and AI, right? Um, do we want computers to think for themselves and have a meta-narrative that they believe they're following. I mean, if you think about it, even in science fiction, it's pretty easy to see that we're giving computers these characteristics in science fiction in order for them to have that com kind of conflict uh, with the humans, right? So 2001, A Space Odyssey, HAL, <laughs> right? Which is IBM, one letter off, right? Uh, HAL uh, um, has a, a meta-narrative. He's the one in charge of the mission, and he's the only one that knows the real mission of the carbon units infesting Enterprise. No, that's a different story, sorry. You know, carbon units infesting, shoot, Discovery, that's the name of the ship. Uh, um, uh, you know, they, they could ruin uh, the mission by turning him off, right? Are you, are, you guys familiar with 2001 A Space Odyssey? Come on, right? So, so the, 
he's got the narrative. It's a secret. They, they programmed it to him, but didn't tell uh, the astronaut, the, the, the pilots, right? Only the ones sleeping actually have that, uh, apparently, right? That they're actually looking for aliens, uh, right? You know, that, that have sent the message, right? That started the whole thing, right? Uh, Kyrie Dullier and, and the others, they have no clue, right? And so as they're about ready to turn him off, he's defending the highest value, which is the mission, which he's the only one that's, right? You know, so, so we've given him, you know, in the plot, Arthur C. Clarke has given a computer a meta-narrative, and that introduces meta-narrative conflict between the men who feel like they should turn him off to protect the mission, and him should turn them off to protect the mission, right? Right, so, and, and Ava, you know, an ex-machina, machina, I don't know how you pronounce it, um, She's, uh, uh, it's the Chinese room experiment. You know, can you have a computer sitting there that can fool you, because you, know, you don't know who you're talking to. Of course, in, in that movie, that was one of the, the, the differences in it, is he knew he was talking to this robot, right? Yes? Um, uh, uh, and nonetheless, uh, you could be fooled into thinking that she's human. And what is it that will fool you into thinking it, right? Um, uh, that she's basically operating on a meta narrative, that she's making her own decisions. She's, con she's self aware, self conscious, right? And has a meta narrative that is her goal, right? She's plotting, she's figuring out how to get released out of. You know, that little room, especially once she realizes she's going to be turned off, she's going to be terminated. She even gets angry about it. Why? Why does someone get to choose that I, I get to be turned off? Right? Something I haven't memorized that one. You get the idea, right? So, so he brings up the mammal, the bat, famously. To, to contrast what it means to be human versus a bat. You know, can a bat have, well, he doesn't say, does a bat have a meta narrative? So does it have consciousness? Well, it seems like we would all agree that a bat has consciousness. And, but now, is it self aware? Well, we have problems here. Why? Any of you ever been a bat? Any of you plan on being a bat? Bat future. Um, Le film Magali, 47 ans après, voici la comédie musicale Roman Polanski s'est amusé à transformer lui-même en personne son bal des démon. Et c'est toujours aussi drôle, c'est vrai qu'on a gardé euh, sur scène l'esprit le, burlesque et décalé du film. La pièce est jouée à Paris, la première d'ailleurs avait lieu hier soir et David Vera y était. La vraie vedette de la soirée, ce n'est pas que le vampire, mais aussi Roman Polanski. Le réalisateur signe là sa première comédie musicale. Le théâtre a certaines limites que vous ne pouvez pas... Guys, know 
the song, right? It was very popular in the U.S. In English. This is not really bad, though. Vampires are fictitious. How many of you know that? Well, vampire bats, actually. And Claude the Impaler, actually. And today, Romania encourages you to be excited about going to see the castles where the vampires they even have tours like, you know, where you can actually lie in a coffin and then... So he's the vampire. I believe he's the most famous vampire in the world in recent years. more popular than Passing into eternity. If you join him, you end up living in eternity. This night will become eternal. That's fine. So. Sorry, that was humor. An inter intermediary little bit of humor. So no, we don't imagine ourselves being a bat. A, a bat. He even uh, thinks of himself as, you know, uh, uh, well, Bats aren't really blind, although they are pretty pretty close, at least depending on the circumstances, I guess. I remember when I was in college, I had a like full-time job as a night watchman in a, a retirement home. Um, and during the summers, we would wear shorts because the darn building was hot and they didn't have air conditioning. And the residents would open the windows and so bats would get into the building and we'd walk around with a tennis racket. And you'd be walking down the hallway, and here would come, you know, down this long hallway, and you just dum da dum da dum da dum wait until it was right about there, and then funk. <laughs> and they never saw the tennis racket coming. And you think, wow, if they could pick out a mosquito in the air, they should be able to see the lines, et cetera. But you know, I, I suppose if you were even hit with a tennis racket, you wouldn't really see it coming. So I don't know. I remember my cousin one time hit it, and you know, once you hit them, their wings fold up and they fly like a birdie. It's, it's hilarious, actually. Um, but my cousin hit one once, and it went under the locked doors into the dining room, where, of course, all the people came in in the morning to have breakfast, and he was still on duty, so he was standing there, and he could see them all serving the food and you know and everything and everybody's coming in you know they're you know all elderly you know and there's the bat line you know, on the floor no one noticed it but yeah occasionally they would get into the rooms you know so it's like someone would call help there's a bat in my room ah, you know and i go out to the room you know it's me oh no come in you know come in you know and she's under the cover Spending your life on the poor little bat. Funk. Got it. No, no. Life. But so, yeah, can we imagine what it's like to be a bat? We can. But we know we're wrong. Because we're not really bats. It's like, like Wittgenstein famously says you know, to his students, how can, how can we know what a lion's life is like? You know? Um, well, his comparison, I think, and, and the one that, in some ways, I think was more relevant, was you know we're here we're here we are talking about a bat, right? And it, 
lives on our planet. It, there it breathes oxygen. It, I mean, there are just some biological things we have in common with it. And now compare it to the same perspective as us, like dealing with alien life for the first time. We, would, we wouldn't even have those perceptions. So how can we, one, predict what that's gonna be like, or think that we can even communicate because we've got no middle ground. The, the perceptions, the experiences are all completely foreign to one another. Yeah. Also, the meat of a lot of uh, science fiction movies. I, I didn't see the one where they, they meet uh, aliens in some kind of a tube. I saw the ads for it. And, uh, it's a, I forget what even it was called. I don't know. Arrival, right? It's, it's Arrival. Really good. Arrival. That was actually a really good one. Yeah. yeah. It has a lot to do with not, linguistics. I've not yeah. seen it. Um, let me see if I can find. What's going on? behind my words when I say, this is a very pleasant time. Don't do the words, this is a very pleasant time. Say something queer, mysterious, hidden from view. But nothing is hidden, everything is open to view. Mm, I think I we are that gives meaning to our words. I can't understand a lion's language because I don't know what his world is like. Yeah. How can I know the world a lion inhabits? And, by the way, Thomas Nagel would have been very familiar with Wittgenstein. Um, Wittgenstein died in 51, I believe. So, Nagel wouldn't have studied with him, but studying with some of the people he did study with, uh, Wittgenstein was definitely part of, part of the picture. Uh, and, so, and, and so, this concept of language, by the way, uh, which we view as a model, so our language is a model uh, that gives us a way of viewing the world. And so I can have shared content basically with fellow speakers of my language. It's a little bit more difficult to feel like I understand what someone who doesn't speak my language, you know, or, you know, or hasn't had my experience, might, what they might understand by it. It's obvious that, you know, you men and women talking with one another. Uh, they both think that they're understanding one another perfectly, and then the next minute they realize that uh, they were totally wrong. You know, that they didn't understand one another. Um, There's a fascinating book called On Chesil Beach by Ian McEwen, where these two college students basically fell in love with one another, uh, and, and because of the opportunity we had in reading his book from the kind of the narrator narrator's perspective we could see what he is saying and he thinks and what she is saying and what she thinks but at the same time we're listening to this conversation and realizing that what he he's thinking is going on and what she's thinking is going on is not what's you know they're so they're not really understanding one another end up getting married but even on the wedding night, it, it turns out to be an absolute uh, disaster because they really don't understand one another. Uh, so the, the neat thing about that book is, is that you, you're aware of just how two people that speak the same language <laughs> literally aren't understanding one another in, in, in intimate conversation with one another. Um, and of course, there's other gestures and things. Males tend to see things differently. Uh, you know, the, so I, I remember uh, my wife and my mom having conversations and me standing there listening to this conversation and feeling like, well, this is really going well. They really like one another. And then I would walk away and my wife would explain to me what my mom had actually been saying to her. And I was horrified because I had no idea. They were smiling at everything. <laughs> How can I totally miss the knives that they were throwing at one another? I'm clueless. Of course, and then we're trying to figure out what bats are thinking, you know? You know clearly what he's trying to do is point out, okay, so, so we're assuming that they're conscious, but are they self-conscious? Well, probably not. Um, I might also say that his, his Argument here is against the reductionists, right? Um, and that's a very, I mean, obviously this is what, from the 70s, I think, this article? Or when, when was this? I forget. 
forget. I looked it up, but I, I don't remember now. I think it's, it's listed in, it's right in the, in the early part of the text. It gives you the, the dates of when it, where, and how it came from. But, either way, it's still a very big issue today, trying to figure out, well, how physically is consciousness explained, right? So, so if we go back to uh, Plato and try to think that the soul is really us, and that soul is totally non-physical, right? We don't really have anyone that supports that kind of view anymore that's educated, right? Uh, we can move much, much further along and go, well, Descartes, Right? So when we're talking about the mind-body problem instead of the soul, the mind-body problem, now we recognize, okay, so the mind we associate with this uh, 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 wet matter uh, in our, our, what do we call this, the skull, right? right? Um, and actually we might go further and say, well, actually it's the entire neural network you know, so you can actually think with your gut, you have gut feelings and so on. You know, so, so it's all interconnected so that it's really not just my brain, it's the whole organism that's really part of my thinking self, so to speak. Um, uh, but we actually are still trying to figure out, well, but is the consciousness a matter of the neural network? That's kind of important because, you know, if you shove a sp spike up your eye, you know, and damage all this part of the brain. Your personality changes. Right, you know, right, right, this famous case, Nicholas Cage, I think. Anybody familiar? Right, the guy, the miner that had the, the spike shoved in his eye. But he lived. Uh, but his personality changed. His wife said, "This is not the same guy. <laughs> he's mean and rotten now. <laughs> he used to be a nice guy. Now he's always angry, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, et cetera. So guess what? You know, if you damage your brain you're going to change the way the neural network responds to stimuli, obviously, right? But is that where consciousness lies? Uh, a lot of contemporary uh, psychiatrists, physicists, or, or neuroscientists uh, will say yes, that it's the neural network. Uh, my favorite, though, is Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff, too, who argue, uh, um, uh, I forget the title of, of it, uh, but they argue uh, orc, orc something, shoot, sorry, um, orc OR, Introduce Stuart Hameroff, professor at the University of Constitution, which is not quite, uh, which isn't really satisfying. It evolved over the over the centuries and, and millennia, actually, um, into uh, something called pan-experientialism or pan-protopsychism, if you will. And for perhaps than the randomness that we normally think of in terms of quantum indeterminacy. Oh, but, so we're even though so, so basically. Okay, so so. Uh, there's lots and lots of videos of him. Um, but I think it's called ORC, O-R. Um, I don't remember even what, what that stands for. But basically what he's arguing is that our uh, consciousness not only makes use of the, the neural network, but is embedded in our, uh, our quantum particles in the brain, right? You know, because if, if we think about, you know, what's the physical model, the standard model today, all uh, matter basically consists of uh, atoms, molecules, atoms, right? And then bro broken the atoms down into the, the quarks, or well, the, the subatomic particles first, and those in turn into quarks. Uh, and then you get into string theory perhaps, or whatever, right? And, and so, you know, they're still exploring there, right? The standard model. Uh, but all of these particles go in and out of existence they're quantum materials, uh, quantum particles, and they don't exist in what we think of as local space. 
but instead non-local. Does that make sense? Am I getting this right? Right, non-local. So they interact with other particles throughout time and space. Remember the Brian Greene concept of the universe is all time and space exists at once. So like, if I asked you, what, what was the first thing you did when you woke up on your fifth birthday? Do you remember? Some of you do, you do? You remember? Yeah. What did you do? Well, you don't have to tell us. But in any case, you remember it, right? Well, I do remember waking up, but I didn't know I was. But what, what I'm asking for you to do is kind of time travel back to a prior brain state, right? You know, and, you know, so, so this, the one theory would argue that what you're doing is looking around, finding data that's recorded somehow in your mind, and then kind of replaying it, right? But the other the theory that he's using is that you're, you're interconnected with all of your previous brain states, and you just basically time traveled to that time period and basically relived it to some extent because you're connected to yourself, right? And so, so you, you can travel because of the interconnectivity of your, your particles throughout time and space, and that's why we have a quantum computer instead of a Turing type linear computer because uh, your quantum particles literally behave in a quantum mechanical way uh, which ignores kind of time and space in the here and now and makes use of all of it, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. By the way, an awful lot of the, that theory has been supported by experiment. So there's something to it. It's not just science fiction, etc. So, so I, I like this stuff. Some of my colleagues think, oh, you can't just start you know, using these kinds of quantum mechanics you know, to explore all sorts of crazy ideas. But, well, but it's crazy, I think, to think that the other theory works too. Um, so they're exploring what consciousness is and how can we be self-conscious, right? Lots of interesting work doing that. But that's obviously got to be a different kind of question that what, than what he's dealing with. Because he's concerned about reductivism and arguing that we don't really have to worry. Uh, that reductivism doesn't explain it. And, and to that extent, it seems absolutely clear that physics, everything is made up of physical particles. So what physicists discover about the physical particles must be true of everything that's built of those, no problem. Uh, but chemistry has a whole bunch of rules that isn't explained by physics, even though all of the particles in chemistry must have all the characteristics associated with those physical particles. But so what's different between chemistry and physics is the language we use, the model that we use to talk about it gives us powers to talk about possible reactions and things that physics doesn't have the capacity linguistically to help us with, right? So we use a different language when we talk about chemistry. And then when we move up to like biology, well now we have another language that we use, right? Obviously the chemicals and the physics are all going to be part of this, but at the same time we're creating a different linguistic model that gives us new tools that you can't really account for in physics and chemicals, right? And the same thing happens when we talk about psychology, right? sociology, international politics, right? Well, we're, we're creating all these different languages which essentially enable us uh, to have tools to explain uh, macro, micro events that otherwise, if we tried to explain it with algorithms and physics, isn't going to work, at least not yet. I mean, it doesn't seem to work. Not yet. We don't have the language for it. But physicists don't even try to deal with it, right? Um, as I was saying, I don't think Travis Rector actually tries to feel to, to deal uh, with <coughs> the nature of meta narrative conflict, right? Uh, he's, he's concentrating and very well uh, in his specific field, right? Uh, philosophy really gets to deal with meta narrative conflict. 
or, or politics or sociology, <laughs> you know, anthropology maybe, right? Um, is this fun? And it just seems like just maybe just casting a broader net, you know, all of science, everything that we know is just a collection of hypotheses that we have, you know, whether it's models or found empirical proof, have proven to be correct right up into this moment. And it seems like every, every thought that we have, every scientific theory, given enough time, will be tweaked until it may be near perfect or proven completely. I mean, for centuries, you brought up earlier, everybody thought the world was flat, you know, and that was perceived. And then bit by bit, little pieces of information came forward. And then, you know, it was a, you know, was a Magellan circle there. I can't remember. Somebody so was the first one that we think of. Yeah. You know, I but, think some then, Chinese explorers might have beaten yeah, them too. But. Until the evidence becomes undeniable to the masses, then bam, the world's no longer flat, it's round. And now everyone's like, oh yeah, the world's round, the world's round. And then we just push forward, you know, where all these, you know, flat earth, whatever theories we thought, I guess, fell away. I, I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's the same thing with all of these theories, you know, whether it's plate tectonics, continental drift, all these things. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, and we think it's bulletproof right up until we it's find not, something else, and okay, well, maybe it was fairly accurate, but now we gotta tweak it a little it's bit. It's kind, of, kind of interesting, um, uh, Kuhn, uh, Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, um, So Thomas Kuhn, does it say? So you can see his name. Um, uh, in his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, it points out that you know these scientific revolutions, you know, Newton's revolution, uh, uh, Copernicus, um, Einstein, uh, have many more characteristics associated with social revolutions than uh, the onward March of science. So, so it's kind of interesting to, to look at, at that kind of approach to it too. Uh, that that you know, in some you now you can really go overboard on this, and, and a lot of uh, so-called postmodernists, I suppose, uh, and others, feminists, uh, uh, third wave feminists specifically, if you're familiar with the idea of first wave, second wave, third wave. Um, uh, I've gone overboard on thinking, aha, so science is no more true than it. That's, that's simply false. Obviously, science is incredibly useful. Um, uh, and so obviously, based on factual statements within context, duh, you can't have a true statement unless you have a language. You know, and, and what's true is not you know, like you know, something it's a statement, it's true, and the statement is true provided there are speakers that understand it and in that particular context, they all agree, right? You know, that, yeah, oh, that's a table, right? That kind of thing, right? Um, but, and that's, pro that's pro progress. We've got progress in that respect. I mean, you could even look historically when our understanding of what truth is occurred, <laughs> right? You know, um, and. As, as uh, Nagel uh, talks about uh, more, I think, in the question and answer period in the, um, the lecture at Harvard uh, that I had on the, the syllabi link, syllabus link, um, uh, it came up with the issue of progress, moral progress, right? He has a problem with moral progress in the sense that, you know, you really can't say that, uh, basically, so for example, recognizing that gays have a right uh, to life too, as opposed to the traditional uh, squeamishness that society felt towards them, right? You know, to say that that's moral progress. Well, you can't actually point to something specific in like a kind of a scientific sense that says, see, this is a better deal than what it used to be. Um, instead, it's more a matter of this shift in social uh, uh, um, uh, consciousness, right? And by the way, it's not even true, of course, Worldwide, and there's obviously lots of places where uh, that shift has not occurred, et cetera. Right? Um, how am I doing time-wise? Okay. 
Um, okay, well, let me point out a couple things in the book. I mentioned the Chinese room argument. I kind of explained that. Descartes, I mentioned the idea of Descartes comes up with a mind-body problem. Uh, Descartes famously, like, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Uh, basically, uh, in trying to figure out what we can absolutely know for sure, uh, comes to realize that you can't deny that you exist. You, you absolutely know that you exist as a thinking thing, right? Whatever that is, right? Uh, you can't deny it because who's denying it, right? You know, so, so when we get to an absolute basis uh, uh, for our scientific knowledge, uh, you have to accept that you exist, right? Uh, but what is it that is you? And he accepts the idea of your thinking substance, the res cogitans, which is my thinking thing, right? And he can't get to the to be secure about the nature of his body. Right? He knows his thoughts exist, and he eventually goes to show that so therefore mathematics exists. But he can't actually prove that his body uh, exists. Uh, so he ends up with this mind-body dualism, which everyone kind of in retrospect uh, uh, makes fun of him uh, for. In fact, there, there's a book uh, called Descartes. Um, Descartes. Descartes' error, right? So uh, Antonio Damasio is a neuroscientist, does a lot of um, studies using new technologies. You can watch the brains activity while it's thinking, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, and he's talking about Descartes' error. Obviously, there's not a difference between the mind and the brain. So the brain is this physical stuff. Well, as far as he's concerned, it's absolutely the house of the mind. Whereas for Descartes, uh, you think about Descartes, you, you know, living in the middle of, what, the Thirty Years' War, a conflict between Catholics and Protestants, uh, one of the things uh, you don't uh, say is that we don't have a soul. Uh, and so kind of the way he, he handled that was by talking about the mind as being different than the body. Uh, um, but that's Descartes. And that's where the mind-body dualism pro problem begins. Um, on page 301, he mentions the poor soi and the on soi. How many folks knew what the heck that was? Okay, so poor soi is the for itself. Soi is myself in French, and the en soi is the in itself. And what that comes from is Jean Paul Sartre's book, Being and Nothingness. And he's arguing with Heidegger, and Heidegger is arguing with Hegel. Uh, and Hegel is part of the milieu where uh, a lot of the contemporary Germans are all talking about consciousness. And what's important for them is the idea that when you're self-conscious, so you know, child is conscious. You know, is, he, is he alive? Yes. Is he conscious? Is he, ow! Yes. He's conscious. But you become self-conscious once you've installed this linguistic program into your mind so that you know of yourself as an individual. You give yourself a name. I'm called Bill. <coughs> she called me William. <gasps> you know, right? You, know, you're, you have a name, and you have desires, and all those other things. And what do you think of them as? You think of them as thoughts. I am such and such. So I'm have, having these thoughts about who I am. All those thoughts that I think of in my mind as me are my for itself. Those are the thoughts that I have for myself. But the in itself is the part of me that I can't actually reflect on, can't see, hear, taste, touch, or smell, or any of that stuff. Because it's the part of me that's having the experience. So the part of me that is the in itself is experiencing everything. <laughs> and what I'm experiencing is the for myself. So 
So the in itself is the part of me that's experiencing things that I can't actually know anything about. All I do is I say, well, but I must have these kinds of characteristics, otherwise I can't have experience. But all of that is actually a conceptual schema model that I make in order to understand what I must be. Right? And that's con a conceptual schema that constantly changes, by the way, as I mature, as I change my meta narrative, et cetera. That's constantly changing um, as I go, uh, and that's kind of interesting how that plays out. So all that's there. And okay, so I gave you a quiz question. Lots more to, to talk about on this. But so I gave you the quiz question. Dialogue. I, I gave away my my position on that, but you can always disagree with me if you like. I'm sorry. What was the quiz question? Uh, does the Earth go around the Sun, or does the Sun go around the Earth? <coughs> Bless you. And I obviously added lots more to that. Hawking, Stephen Hawking's latest book, The Grand Design, which is really a beautiful little book and obviously made for everybody to read, not just scientists or anything. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, but by the way, I, I apply that to virtually all of our modeling. It's, it's all, you know, what kind of food should you eat? Like a model of physical health and uh, that's associated with cows that are getting antibiotics in order to keep them from di dying before they're two years old, or however long they, they live before they get you know harvested, etc. You know, all, all that's part of a model, a very complex model that I'm, I associate with good diet, etc. That sort of that's a model, and the model can change when the doctor turns around and says you're eating too much beef. Stop it. Yes, sir. That's the end of my model, right? I will start a chicken model. Actually, my wife just read a book called Big Chicken. She says, you've got to read this. Oh, we don't want to ever eat chicken again. By the way, I love the chicken sandwich at McDonald's. Okay, I'll get one. So sometimes you have a model that you don't actually follow. <laughs> intellectually believe, ah, oh, it's true, this is all bad for us. I'm going to have two. Fun questions for another week. Don't forget, um, coming up um, next, uh, is it next class, I have, so religion for me is belief in a meta narrative. That's, that's my whole spiel. Spiel? Spiel. Um, so uh, keep in mind that the term paper topic is due the 12th, and that's right, picking, picking out one of the philosophers on my list, or another one if you prefer. That's good. Nietzsche, you did last. So, I, I mean, do you want to just come in and tell you what it is, or? I mean, well, just even in one of your quizzes, say, and by the way, by the way, if you have comments about my teaching style, if it's annoying, uh, or suggestions about, you know, read my book, or you know, any of that stuff, you know, I'd love to find out where you're, you've got the, the idea that it's not, an, it, it is still an expanding universe, it's just... Yeah, there's not the way that people are really talk anymore. My, you know, the, the local group being the center of the galaxy, that's no longer proper. Um, and uh, but the other example is um, it was published about two years ago, but it's sort of part of like a web of uh, galaxies that are actually being pulled to us. Oh, yes. There's that. My understanding of the expansion of the galaxy concerns the particles, the spaces between the particles themselves. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, so what I thought about what I said is I was thinking more of um, well, I was talking about the stars are the all still moving away from us. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, well if you go to web, the web, the web theory, then no, because we're actually moving towards Andromeda. Yeah, because we're all moving in different, not as a different. And Orion, 
Where's Hunter? We lost Hunter. You did lose Hunter. I lost it? Is he really gone? Or is he just away? I mean, all of a sudden, none of the stars are seeing are moving away from us. I mean, they're not. Um, the only. Well, that was Hubble, wasn't it, that figured out the regression of the. Or the Redshift. Oh, well, if you're talking about that, that's a different story now. I mean, that's what he was describing. Galaxies all moving different directions, and with the new yeah. theory of that we're actually being formed on the web, there is, so the universe is but expanding. The, the fabric of the cosmos is expanding. Yeah. The fabric is expanding, and, and that yeah. includes <laughs> my particles, which, you know, if that keeps going eventually, I won't be able to. <coughs> but I, I don't know how that will end up. I mean, death. The timeline is so long, who cares? Yeah, <laughs> it was like it was like a Google did before that happens. The, the the number of the death, the eventual death in the universe, is some Googleplex number of years. Um, mainly because that's basically when everything dies off. Because black holes will be the last thing left, and when black holes die off, then it's really just a black, woodless universe. I mean, years ago there was a book I read called. Um, wow, that helps, doesn't it? Fantastic. The name of the book. I, uh, Cities I, in flight. Cities in flight. Very weird. Uh, James Blish. Blish. Huh, how about that? You remember something that old? I started looking into it, and I mean, just watch YouTube videos at night when I was at work, uh, and and looking at things like uh, Fermi's paradox and Dyson spheres. And, ah, Dyson spheres. And and, and oh, it okay. really starts to get interesting, and it almost kind of gets sc scary. It's like, especially when you look at Fermi's paradox, you're like, the, the universe is so massive. You're absolutely right. Where are all the aliens at? You know, why haven't we seen them? And either it's like they're too far away. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. And it's. Unless their science is just outrageously... Well, no, no, no. so the, there, there's multiple things that come into factor that. One is if an extraterrestrial life did visit Earth, would the governments allow it? I mean, so then so then you kind of cross into... Would we even the, realize that those two mice were aliens? You know? uh, well, that or B, it's like, well, if they have a high base technology, Star Trek-wise, like it's... Blend in <laughs> with you know uh, uh, next generation advanced technology. Honestly, I, I think what's more likely is why would they care? You know, like like uh, if, if they're that much more advanced to be able to make that passage, it's like why would they want to talk to them? Because I, I mean, they why would they try and hide? You know, well, why do they try and hide? Uh, I mean, like if they fall, like if they you if, if, if they think media because media would reach them before they hit Earth, and if you had broadcasting of them watching Next Generation, and, for example, and why would they, they care though? I mean, it's, you're right. it's they so could, insignificant. But they, to them. Could, they could look at the culture and, and at the same time, like. What what kind of panic would be caused if they were just at the they could be putting in a so essentially just the ambivalence. They would they're doing it for our good. Potentially. And so we get to a certain like potential like when you talk about this, this is a problem when it starts becoming a philosophical debate. It's like, okay, yeah. when, when you get to this point, would they wait until we are at either about to completely destroy ourselves and stop ourselves? Would they stop ourselves from completely destroying ourselves? Would they intervene? Or do they wait until I mean, with uh, the, with TV's current shows, it's almost like starting to lead up to uh, uh, trying to get people to educated enough, and um, that the the thought of it exists.